Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Yulia Zoja. I am with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington University, and I'm joined by... Giselle Donnelly. I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and... Salva Rohat, also a senior fellow at AEI. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. Um, to date, we are joined by um, our guest, who is Yulia Fadiv, currently Humphrey Fellow at the Syracuse University, former CEO of Romatska TV in Ukraine, and um, former CEO of the Ukrainian Cultural Fund. If you enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Yulia, it's great to have you with us. Before we get started into culture wars, democratic reform, corruption, and Ukrainian culture abroad, tell us first um, about your career over the last few years in Ukraine and tell us what Romatska TV is exactly and what the Ukrainian Cultural Fund is. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here today with you. After the revolution of dignity in 2014, in Ukraine started uh, the processes of reformation in the public sector and also within the civil society. In these years, from the 2014 till nowadays, uh, we created a lot of new public institution within the Ukrainian Institute that promotes Ukraine abroad, Ukrainian Cultural Fund, which supports uh, culture and creative industries in Ukraine, a Ukrainian Startup Fund, Ukrainian Veteran Fund, and like a lot of others. And uh, at the same time, also uh, we created a lot of independent media outlets before 2014, Mostly in Ukraine, media market was presented by the oligarch media and uh, public media. So Hromatsky was uh, the first media created in 2014 by the journalist as an NGO, uh, supported only through the crowdfunding and also International Donor Foundation. And uh, Hromatsky was the voice of Maidan, of the Revolution of Dignity. Until now, it's an independent media made by the journalists themselves. And the main audience of Romaitska are the people who want to uh, critically analyze what is going on in Ukraine in its political, cultural, social life, and want to influence uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian society and what is going on in Ukraine. And Ukrainian Cultural Fund was established in 2017 uh, according to the law. Uh, it was special law about the Ukrainian Cultural Fund. And since 2018, it started its uh, work. And actually, what was newly by the Ukrainian Cultural Fund, uh, it was the first institution which uh, supposed uh, to... Um, support not only public institution but also non-governmental sector by public money and the main aim of the ukraine culture fund was a distribution of uh, the taxpayers money uh, on the transparent uh, and basis and be accountable to the ukrainian citizens and to show them where the money i invested in and uh, it was like the first in institution under the Ministry of Culture. Now it's the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy. Uh, but after that, it was also created several of such foundations. Nowadays, I think it's more than six funds that uh, support NGOs in different sectors, in social sphere, in education, uh, in military sector, in startup in innovation, and like culture and uh, creative industries. Uh, so um, I have been the CEO of Ukrainian Cultural Fund from 2018 till 2021. Actually, I was the first uh, elected uh, CEO of the public institution because also till 2014, mostly the CEOs of the public institutions uh, were uh, elected by the ministers. And uh, like they said, who should be the director, uh, but uh, according to the new laws after 2014, 
uh, this open uh, competition was established so the people could apply for the public positions. Uh, and uh, it's like the start of meritocracy in Ukraine when a lot of people from international organizations, uh, from the non-governmental sector uh, could apply uh, to be a public servant and uh, to switch uh, to the public positions. I won one. I was one of them before uh, actually 20 17 I was mostly working in the non-governmental sector and for the international organization uh, I have been working with GIZ uh, with Konrad uh, uh, Adenauer Foundation uh, with uh, German Polish Ukrainian Society uh, with uh, uh, Creative Europe Desk it's uh, like the program of European delegation in Ukraine supporting arts and culture so actually Ukrainian Culture Fund was my first public position and uh, after that in 2021 when my contract was over I switched back to the non-governmental sector and became the CEO of Hromaisky UA as I already said it's like non uh, it's like independent NGO working in media sector and we it's like digital media Hromaisky UA has a web page and is present also in all social media it also has a really great YouTube channel uh, because Hromaisky was created with uh, great journalists, political journalists and reporters. So I fully recommend to subscribe for YouTube channel of Hromaisky. And it's bilingual, so it's not only in Ukrainian, but has uh, English subtitles to most of the videos. And I think also some of them are, have German subtitles. And if you want to know what is going on now in Ukraine, uh, Hromaisky is the best media for this because it's always in the forefront of uh, the hotspots uh, the journalists are traveling all over, around ukraine and a report about the military actions about the voluntary work and about the people who were liberated after the russian occupation uh, so it's it's it's, it's really great media i, I admire hromaitske because people who are working non-stop and i really independent media so uh, hromaitske has never got any money from oligarchs or from politicians and uh, it was like fully um, supported in the first years by Ukrainians themselves. During the Revolution of Dignity, Hromaitskia had received like over 20 million uh, grimnas from Ukrainian citizens who were donating for Hromaitskia. And then it switched to different grants and donors uh, from all over the world, mostly Europe and US. So sorry for pretty <laughs> long introduction. Uh, yeah. yeah, but much to say about the both institution. I, I know we want to talk about um, reform and um, the fight for that, but just a, a comment based on, on, on your um, expose. You said at some point, um, this is the... This is the beginning of meritocracy in Ukraine, but it sounds ast uh, astonishing from someone coming from a neighboring but EU country. And I've seen that with um, public reform as well. I know we want to talk about that too. You are far ahead of some of the EU countries neighboring you um, when it comes to that. And I think um, I think these are some of the great examples within that realm. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the problems that you see um, now you're here in the United States, the problems that you see when it comes to exactly that reform um, uh, in the public sector and the difficulties that Ukraine encounters in pushing for reform when at the same time fighting a full scale war? Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge, actually, because uh, during the last 30 years of um, Ukrainian being independent after the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, we had like three big revolutions uh, in 1991, in 2004 and 2014. And uh, since 2014, we have the war going on on our territory. Firstly, it was mostly focused on the eastern part of Ukraine in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Uh, Crimea was uh, annexed by the Russian Federation. And in um, February 2022, 
it was already the full escalation and invasion of Russian troops on the whole territory of Ukraine. Uh, but when we are talking about the reforms, I think we all know that for the stable reformation process, we need some stable situation inside the country when people are living in peace and can really concentrate not on fighting against something, but fighting for something. So we didn't have actually this proper amount of time to concentrate properly on the reformation and this like public private cooperation when the citizens of Ukraine can control how the reforms are um, going on uh, and uh, also to make the government accountable for the deeds uh, because when you are fighting against external enemy it's not so easy as to say, to fight against internal enemies too, because in each country, in each democracy, we have so-called like internal enemies who are against democratic processes. I think Ukraine is not the exception. But when we are fighting almost all of the time against like the external enemies, we cannot do properly our internal work. So what I see in Ukraine now, we really need this uh, period of stability. I hope we will get it after the... Um, after we will win, uh, but now it's like I feel this too that we are like we have a, a lot of battlefields in Ukraine, one against Russia and other against the old system, uh, because uh, Soviet the people who uh, were working during the Soviet period, who were the public servant during the Soviet period, they are still in Ukraine and they are still part of the system and what i saw as uh, newly elected a ceo of a newly established public institution i was pretty romantic i was thinking okay when i can establish something from the scratch uh, i can do it properly i know how it was done in the western european countries i have uh, some knowledge about the other culture foundation and i can do it like um really properly, but uh, I forgot that I'm uh, working not in a space, uh, I'm the part of the full ecosystem, and the ecosystem, like what I'm talking about, the government, the ministries, the part of the government, the parliament, the office of president, like all this uh, ecosystem is still working not according to the new rules, but according to the old rules. And in each uh, part of the power, there are people who have this image of the old Ukraine, or not Ukraine, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, those people, they were against changes. They didn't want the new faces. They didn't want the people who have other perspective. Uh, that's why it was always like a fight um, not for something, but against something, and it was exhausting. Uh, actually, that's why I decided not to maintain and not to go for the second round, uh, because I didn't see the point of this struggle. Yes, so I, um, with my team, we made everything possible to establish the new institution, uh, but it's all always the confrontation with the Ministry of Finance, with the Ministry of Culture, with other ministries, uh, because uh, like I think that the system should be um, not rebuilt, but built from the scratch. Uh, I don't know, maybe the war, uh, it's sadly to say this, but is this tool just to destroy uh, the old system uh, and built something from, from the very beginning. Uh, as we know from the change management, it's always easy to begin from the scratch and not to rebuild existing systems. But in Ukraine, like we are constantly during these 30 years, try to rebuild the old Soviet system uh, with a small inception, small drops of the new uh, values, of the new concepts. And it's like a Ukrainian national dish borscht, you know, like we have a lot of ingredients, <laughs> but have it taste. Borscht is delicious. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> I hope Speak that yourself, at the end we, we will have this delicious dish because now sometimes I think that we have or too much beetroots or too much carrots 
automatic tomato sauce. So now it's like, you know. Uh, and, and the aftertaste of Sovietism in borscht is not really great. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm all for redoing borscht from scratch. <laughs> I mean, this is such a, such a fascinating account because I think particularly Yulia and I coming from Eastern Europe ourselves can, can, can totally relate to your struggles. I mean, we have, both of us have numerous friends who, you know, maybe educated in the West or elsewhere, sort of went into public service back in Romania and Slovakia, respectively, with expectations that they'll change things. And and they've been running into the same sort of frustrations as, as you have. You, you've already alluded to this possibility of, of the war providing a sort of cathartic moment for uh, Ukrainian you know, civil service, policymaking more generally, institutions. Uh, I mean, you have to wonder whether this might really be an opportunity for sort of leapfrogging in a way that would allow Ukraine to to move even beyond what is the normal standard in in you know say Western European countries. I mean, I heard the story of a you know Ukrainian refugees in 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 the UK complaining about the National Health Service. You know, like when you register with your primary care doctor in the UK, like you, you have to wait for a letter. And the NHS sends you letters, and 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 people from Ukraine just find it mind-boggling. Like you know, all of that has been digitized in in Ukraine ages ago, and and they just don't understand how the UK can sort of still operate in a sort of you know mail-in letters. So, so I wonder if you have any examples of uh, of sort of areas where you see uh, opportunities for reforms that could be catalyzed. Through 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 this war and you know public administration or or even in you know in, in sort of culture policy more generally where where there is a sort of reformist ferment where you know the sort of old establishment has been sidelined by you know younger and more dynamic reformist types. I, I think the the main reason uh, for. Uh, that it it would be possible, you know, like to reform Ukraine and to make it differently as it was before the war uh, it's that during the last uh, eight nine years like since the revolution of dignity and especially during the last year we see that in ukraine the horizontal uh connections are stronger than hierarchical uh connections yes so a vertical one so the yeah. ukrainian civil society is growing and the people who are more um I don't know um, who are, who are, who think who are more connected with uh, Ukrainian state. I don't know how to properly say it in English, but like who are, who really feel that they are part of the state and they do not because during the Soviet times it was always like a state that is some objective, you know, like I don't know like what it is, and we we are the people. So state and people they're like two two different terms, but now people finally realize that actually we are the state, you know, like, uh, so the Ukraine uh, is the people of Ukraine. And uh, those people of Ukraine who are now really active fighting uh, on the battlefield, uh, fighting um, in their cities, like maintaining, working, developing their businesses, uh, supporting Ukrainian armies through uh, a lot of voluntary initiatives, they make the public servants accountable and they will not uh, keep silent as it was even like, I don't know, 15 years ago, you know, oh, okay, public servant has done something, it doesn't matter, you know, we will not influence it. Whatever we do, it will, like now in Russia, you know, like whatever we do, it will not influence, that's why we are keep silent because like Putin decides everything. So in Ukraine, we have different perspective and we have different view that we can influence everything what is going on in Ukraine. If we don't want uh, the president, which is now taking its place because he has done something wrong, we will go on the streets, we will fight for it and we will change the president. You know, and it's like in each, and I see it in cultural sphere too, because we have a lot of conflicts. And before, the Ukrainian culture institutions will keep silent because they were dependent on the ministry. They were waiting for the public money. They didn't want to criticize uh, the ministry or other public servants. But now, uh, they are fighting. They are going out. They are going to the courts. 
uh, they are, uh, I don't know, uh, preparing petitions. So I think it's the main source which we have now. It's integrity and accountability. And also, I don't know, self-esteem. Because previously, we were always thinking that somewhere is better than in Ukraine. You know, like Ukraine is... Uh, uh, like we need to leave Ukraine to go study abroad, uh, to find some other places in other European countries or to go to US, to Canada, it doesn't matter. Now Ukrainians, because of the war, as you said, as refugees, uh, live in other countries and they feel what is to be a part of other culture, uh, of other political, economical, social system and they cherish Ukraine more. It's bad, you know, but sometimes it's said that to understand yourself better, you need to leave your country, you need to leave, like, to go abroad to see you better. I think now Ukrainians are starting to see ourselves better. But all these changes mostly were made during the last nine, ten years. And digitalization, uh, meritocracy, um, independent media, uh, more active civil society, horizontal uh, communications, horizontal networks. It's everything was created during the last nine, ten years. So I hope, and I not only hope, I believe that the European Union uh, needs uh, the new countries like Ukraine to come in and to, like, I don't know, to rethink the concept of European integration, uh, because also I am questioning everything uh, we were taught by the European experts and American experts who came to Ukraine during the last like 15, 20 years to teach us how to be accountable. What is democracy? What is human rights? Uh, what is good governance? But even the February 2022 show, has shown us that they speak about the values, but they do not live within these values. And uh, I think that the Europe also changed during this um, last year. And I hope we will manage to compete Russia, not only as a country, but also the concept of autocracy, of, uh, I don't know, evil <laughs> in, uh, on the earth. And we will, um, uh, I don't know, come back to these democratic values, which we were like, for which the European Union was created. So I think Ukraine has a big potential, but if it will survive also, you know, because the people, they disappear. Yes, so we need human resources. We uh, need time resources. We need other resources. So now we are losing these resources. So for us nowadays, the three main resources are the most important one. People, time and weapon. After we will get all these three, so time, <laughs> we really need to be in a hurry because we are losing time. When we are losing time, we are losing people. So without like proper weapon, we will lose time and people. And then I don't know if we can think about the new Ukraine. Uh, yes, and it's always a question of time. We can rebuild Ukraine during like 20, 30 other years. And the world will be changing during the 20, 30 years. So I don't know. It's, it's really harsh to answer it. But yeah, what I see from inside, from outside, Ukraine has what to propose also for all democracies. Yes, like US. I see also here a lot of like negative and positive sides, which in Ukraine are more in the modern era than in, in US. Yeah. Bureaucracy, I think, the mo my, mo most point of for all European <laughs> democracies. Yes, that's why Ukrainian refugees are struggling with uh, the European bureaucracy. Because like if you go to the bank, you need to wait I don't know, three months to get a credit card. And in Ukraine, you can just go online and get a credit card in like, I don't know, in one day. Yeah, it's like personal data protection. I know all other, like, yeah. But nevertheless, you know, it's, I think, more human oriented than like in Germany when you wait three months to get your credit card and you can do nothing. 
uh, during these three months in Germany. Uh, so, uh, as, so, yeah. as a f former employee of the U.S. government and someone who just uh, applied for Social Security only yesterday, I could talk endlessly about the hypocrisy and the sclerosis of the U.S. <laughs> government. However, uh, I, I would like to return at least for one more pass on the subject of uh, Ukrainian culture. Culture has become a weapon of war in the current conflict, particularly on the part of Vladimir Putin, who very much wants to suppress the idea that there is an independent Ukrainian culture, not only that there was one in the past, but that there could be one in the future. You know, I wonder if you would, and, and, you know, again, speaking as the token American <laughs> on the panel, um, you know, I know that Americans are in, in, have been increasingly aware of the independence and the uniqueness of Ukrainian culture. Just this past Christmas, the highlight of our past Christmas season were the choirs that, that came and sang what we know as the Carol of the Bells, but we now know as a uh, of Ukrainian origin or from composed by Ukrainian. Um, but what sh more should we know? What are we missing about the uh, unique nature of Ukrainian culture, either as it has been in the past or as you see it um, emerging from this time of trial? First of all, I think that it would be, it, it's necessity to include Ukrainian studies into the uh, studies of uh, decolonized culture. Because mostly when in US we speak about decolonization, we speak about the Africa and Latin America, and we do not see Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Caucasus as also part of this uh, decolonization narrative. Uh, but it is. Uh, secondly, also to it's also the task for Ukrainians, not for Americans, to talk more about the Ukrainian culture and the main differences between Ukrainian and Russian culture. Because also when I was analyzing the Eastern European studies within different American universities, mostly the name of these studies is Russian and Eastern European studies. But when you go in depth, it's mostly about Russia and to understand Russia and to understand Russian culture, and this romanticism about the Russians, even if you analyze some of the American movies, mostly, uh, like, okay, let's take Netflix, uh, you know, then when you go to the plot, you see that some of the uh, main characters, when they are speaking, I don't know, about going out somewhere, or, I don't know, about the pleasure activity, you... I think in 90% of cases, you will uh, hear the name of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, yeah, Anna Karenina. Like, okay, let's go to the theater, and then it's like Anna Karenina. Yeah, or something like that. Or the they begin speak, again with champagne and oysters. Yeah. yeah, something like that. You know, so yeah. it's like it's good Russian propaganda because like Russia really have done a lot uh, to put its culture on agenda that a lot, especially in Europe, when we have round tables with European artists and they're still saying that it's Putin war, it's not Russian war, and we cannot lose Russian culture because it has brought so many, uh, so much for, for our European culture. And uh, But when we go in depth, we can understand that most of the so-called Russian characters or Russian artists, uh, they are like, they have Ukrainian roots. And it's what we call the colonization of the, like of, of Ukrainian culture, you know, just to understand what was really Russia, what was Soviet Union, because Russia just expropriated the whole history of the Soviet Union, the culture history of the story. Even like I have been to Lokin Martin and the name of Lokin Martin is Sikorsky Lokin Martin. And I ask, okay, Sikorsky, it's Ukrainian, famous Ukrainian. And the employees of Lockheed Martin said to me, no, it's Russian. It's Russian. Yeah. Yes. So and then I was like, okay, going in depth about the Russian empire. And he was like, born in Kiev and said, but it doesn't matter. He's Russian because Russians are great. They have beat helicopters, you know. We cannot compete Russians. But then Sikorsky is Ukrainian and he built 
helicopter. And actually, Ukraine was the best country within the Soviet Union when we talk about the military potential, but after the Soviet Union, it was destroyed. Uh, so it's like, it's more broad perspective. So culture is not only about art. Uh, it's about the perception of Ukraine, about the values of Ukraine, about the main features of Ukrainians, about the strong and weak parts of Ukrainian. So, yeah, it, it should be done both ways. Yeah, Ukrainian institute mostly and Ukrainian embassies and Ukrainian government. We need also like to uh, to put on agenda Ukraine uh, in, 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 in scientific and cultural spheres of all countries, but also maybe it's a time for you uh, to to be more interested in these regions because I had a feeling it's like totally subjective, that after the collapse of Soviet Union, you just gave this part of the world to Russia and it didn't matter for you what is going on there. It's like Russia is responsible. Uh, we will have like the representatives of other media in Moscow. Uh, we will have the representatives of foundation in Moscow and Ukrainians will be applying uh, or will be viewing through the lens of Moscow. And we see it in Deutsche Welle, we see it in other media. So only after the February, some of the main broadcasters open suddenly representatives or central representatives directly to Kyiv. And I hope uh, that Russia will lose and it's good for Russians too, finally to understand that there were no winners at no time. Because even the, after the Second World War, we gave the victory to Russia not to the Soviet Union. We gave victory to Russia. But we forgot that Stalin was the same as Hitler. And we didn't punish Russia and Stalin for their crimes. We forgot about it. Because, like, we, I mean the international society. So I think it's like a huge work ahead uh, for the new generation of Europeans, of Americans, of Eastern Europeans, also just to... I don't want to say rewrite, but reconsider and put new spots uh, on, on new lights on the history and the world history of this region, because it was written by Russia. And I think the Carol of the Bells is also a, a good a sign of it, because 100 years ago, we could already got our independence back. So I wonder if we could sort of segue uh, from, from, from this into the final segment mm -hmm. of the show and, and ask you a little bit about what you consider to be the most exciting cultural exports of Ukraine because there has been even before the war there has been a sort of growing recognition of of, of Ukrainian culture and and, and sort of cu culture works uh, in the in the west with you know Ukraine won the Eurovision contest three times uh you know but the you consider that a major cultural yeah, achievement or not is a separate story, <laughs> but I'm just sort of putting that, that out there for the record. We the can forget that. The Odessa <laughs> Film Festival has attracted wide attention in the in the West. Uh, I think Ukrainian fashion is is, is making rounds globally. Uh, and yes, you do have a very glamorous first lady. I think that that's a that's a very very sort of fair assessment. Uh, Ukrainian literature. I think is 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 very exciting. I've been reading uh, some Oksana Zabushko lately. It's 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 great stuff. So if you if you don't mind sharing with us what you consider to be you know the sort of hottest cultural exports from Ukraine these days that that our listeners should should pay attention to and 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 seek out. Yeah, you are totally right. When we see the culture and creative industries within like nine sectors, uh, like. Uh, the first three you already um, yeah, mentioned. The first one is audiovisual sector. Yes, our movie industry. Uh, it's uh, really uh, developing pretty fast. And we have a lot of co-productions, uh, mostly with European and American producers. And uh, so if, if you were to introduce an American to, to Ukrainian f filmmaking and could recommend two movies, what would they be? Um, okay, like the first one, which is on Netflix, and I think if you want to know more about our president, <laughs> I was he, <laughs> <laughs> has, has to see I didn't this know movie. you knew that. 
Yes, so it's like, uh, I don't know, 100 episodes or something like that, but servant of people, I think it's it's worse to see it and to know. Uh, even I think some episodes of Madam Secretary uh, US <laughs> have some uh, incorporation of the Ukrainian president there. Uh, and um, uh, also, I think, I don't know, I think it's also on Netflix now, the movie of uh, Ukrainian filmmaker uh, Alexian Sov. Uh, um, I don't know in English the name uh, of this creature. I will Google now because I know in Ukrainian. <laughs> Uh, what it is, uh, and also now uh, there are big uh, festival Berlin Alley, and uh, there are also two movies um, uh, I Love You Baby, and also uh, one more I think Iron Butterflies. I will fully recommend to watch them because they are actually about the Ukrainian history during the collapse of Soviet Union through the story of one young woman. Uh, but if you want to feel what is Ukraine, I think it's worth uh, watching it. So, like, Siren to the People, the last movie of Alex and so on Netflix. Reno. Reno in English. Yes, thank you. Reno. And also two last movies. Yeah, I think after Berlin Ali, after the festival, they will be also publicly available. Uh, and you can watch them also online, like the Iron, Iron Butterflies and Baby, I, like, I, I Love You. So, And when we go through the Ukrainian movies uh, during the last five years, there are a lot of movies that are worth watching when you want to understand about Ukraine and Ukrainian culture. The second sector and the second product, yes, it's fashion. Where do we uh, shop? Where do we shop Ukraine? online for Ukrainian fashion? <laughs> what's, what's your favorite brand? I think most of Ukrainian brands, like uh, you can Google Ukrainian Fashion Week. It's a big organization which is promoting Ukrainian fashion abroad since the last 25 years. And they have uh, the um, shows in Ukraine and now abroad. They have like uh, co-production with New York Fashion Week, uh, with Paris Fashion Week, with London Fashion Week. And now I think we have more than 20, 25 brands. You can all see them on Olana Zelenska when she's traveling. And uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, more than Walk and other magazines, uh, they put the names of the brands because I cannot now... Uh, tell you about all 25 and don't want to <laughs> <laughs> make a preferences. Yes, but actually on the web page of Ukrainian Fashion Week, you can see the database of Ukrainian new fashion brands and they are really, really good. I can see say you because I have, as I told, uh, I see the fashion in US. I see that but it's like this segment, which is for the people with a middle income, but high quality. You know, like you invest money, uh, you have good quality and you as a person and not as a celebrity can really have a good stuff to wear. And uh, so I fully that's, recommend... That's exactly what we are looking for. Yes. And now uh, after the war, they are more like going to the international markets. So they, they, they have production in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, Kyiv still, but they can ship you uh, even to US or to Europe. I, I will say that, that the Ukrainian producers on Etsy... That's a great that. suggestion. Yeah, I I, I I speak from personal experience. <laughs> Before we wrap up, because we're running out of time, what about books? A contemporary literature. What are your favorite books that you would recommend to people that haven't read Ukrainian authors um, yet? I will recommend uh, Oksana Zabushka, which uh, was already mentioned. Serhii Zhadam, and uh, also Irena Karpa. I will name three of them. Uh, there are also a lot of more. I think Pan America now promotes uh, Ukrainian um, uh, writers. And uh, you can also go on the webpage of Pan America and uh, see which authors will be published in US in English. But yeah, these three I will fully recommend. Oksana Zabushko, Serhii Zardan, and Irana All right. Yeah, and Ukrainian music too, actually, when we are talking. Oh, yeah. uh, not only yeah. about Eurovision, but yeah, a lot of new artists with really, really great music. What about your favorite artist? I like uh, Hard Kiss. Uh, they are also like um, in English and in Ukrainian. And um, Mama Rika and Kola. 
they are like the, the the newly young Ukrainian artists. And even if you want to fall in love with Ukrainian language, uh, just listen to Mamarika and Kola, and you will enjoy like the melody the melody of Ukrainian language and totally fall in love with it. And if you have possibility learn Ukrainian language too, because it's really important. It was also one of the main points. When you learned Russian language in order to understand Ukraine, then you get the Russian perspective of Ukraine. And what I saw within a lot of European friends who tried to uh, learn Russian language just to go to Ukraine, and now we need to turn back and Ukrainian Institute will actually propose uh, free of charge uh, the, uh, the courses of Ukrainian language in different countries. So if you see the possibility, please, you know, as many languages as you know, as many times you are a person or have to say it. Yeah. So thanks a lot. Yuria Fidu, thank you so much for joining us from decolonization to Ukrainian passion. What a tour de force in um, it's uh, certainly been a pleasure listening to you and learning from you. From me, Yulia Zoja, and my friends. Giselle Donnelly and Dal Buruhaj. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. To stay up to date with the Eastern Front, please give us a follow on Twitter at Eastern Front Pod in one word and sign up for our newsletter through the link included in the show notes. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AI.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye.